Is that your filing? That's not your individual. In other words, if you file Mary, it's and it's over one twenty. Oh, that's 125. 125, yeah. I've got a number of slides, and maybe that's a good point to make. That My slides will say the first number I usually put up there is what it would be, what the threshold is for a single filer. The second number is going to be for joint filers. Obviously. Okay. Um, that pretty much covers the business provisions. Unless anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll run through some of the individual things real quickly. Um, Individual provisions, what's in it for you? Um, probably the, the, the highest profile item in the bill is uh, what's been referred to as the making work pay refundable tax credit, uh, $400 for individuals, $800 for uh, joint filers. You can see the phase out limits um, start at 75 for single filers, 150 for filers. Um, this is a little different, well, it's not a little, it's a lot different than the stimulus bill payments that were enacted, help me, uh, 08, I guess, when we made those payments, where you actually got a check from the government. You're not going to get a check from the government here. What's going to happen is you're either going to see your weekly or monthly withholding amount reduced, and that's where they came up with them. You may have seen on the news media $13 a week. Well, that's where that's coming from. It's just a reduction in the withholding tables for tax based upon individual's income level. If you don't, if you're not, if you're self-employed or you don't, you're not having income tax withhold, but rather you're making estimated payments, you simply can reduce. You can guesstimate. Okay, I know my tax is going to be reduced by this $800. I'll just reduce my estimated payments by some amount of that. Uh, but don't. So self-employed people can take it as a tax credit after you calculate what your. Tax that's is. right. That's that's the way that works. And so the way to get it earlier on is just to reduce your estimated payments um, by you know an, an amount. Um, it's, a, it's obviously a very expensive provision, uh, even though it doesn't look like a lot of money and, you know, you know the pundits on the other side have said $13 a week, what do you do? But um, it's, a, it's a pretty significant number because there's so many people uh, qualify for it. So, um, second provision relates to a one-time payment for certain retirees, Social Security income recipients. Um, that is going to be, I think, I think the way I read that, that is just a check going to come to you. Um, if you get that check, um, and you're eligible for it, and you might otherwise also be eligible for the making work pay credit, you're going to have to reduce the latter by the amount of the check of the former. Uh, AMT relief, alternative minimum tax. Uh, this is um, no big change in the structure of that tax system. It's simply an extension of what we've seen them do for the last several years, which is to an index for inflation the exclusion amounts. When the AMT was initially enacted uh, years and years ago, um, you know, you start with regular tax, you make some adjustments, and then you have this exclusion, and then you compute your tax. That exclusion amount, unlike most other provisions in the code, uh, was not indexed for inflation, so we didn't see that increase year to year to year for deflation. And while it wasn't a, a big issue for many, many years, um, as more and more people became subject to AMT, it became a big issue because there were now drawing more people into paying alternative minimum tax that were never intended to be in that situation when they initially enacted that, that provision. You know, that provision, uh, 78 or 80s when it was enacted, was designed, you can go back and read the congressional reports, it was designed to attack 170 some people uh, who some, uh, some reported said, you know, made all this money and never paid tax. That was the target audience and now we have millions and millions and millions of taxpayers subject to the AMT. Um, and so in an attempt to try to provide try to get us back to what the original intent of that provision was, they continue now year to year to put a patch on it to keep that, uh, at least keep that exclusion amount going up. Uh, the other change is that um, unlike existing law or prior law, there are certain non-refundable credits that you can use to offset AMT. That's not always been the rule. Uh, I said earlier, this, uh, the first time home buyer credit is a um, uh, first introduced last year in the housing, uh, with the housing market being what it was. Um, the provisions in the Stimulus Act are, I think, uh, most people will say a, a fairly significant improvement over the prior year law. The prior law was first time home buyers, if you qualified, could get a $7,500 tax credit, but you then had to pay back 
I think beginning three years after you took the credit and over, uh, I think it was a 15, five or 15 year period, I don't remember. It, effectively an interest free loan um, because you did have to pay it back. Uh, the Stimulus Act provision increases that amount to 8,000, eliminates the no payback, pro, the payback provision with some exceptions. Um, and the other, um, it's good for purchases through November of this year. And the other really nice thing about this provision is you can treat a purchase in 09 is if you made it on the last day of 08. And you can, so you can take that credit, the increased credit of $8,000 in 08. Um, some might argue, well, gee whiz, the people that you know, saw this provision last year, $7,500 interest free, that's a pretty good deal, I'll go buy a home um, that they have to pay back, you know, now get stuck with that provision because uh, versus this new provision. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play out, whether or not uh, there will be a provision that eliminates the payback rule for those who bought homes under the old law, but certainly the new law uh, creates a much more uh, lucrative incentive for people that are, might otherwise not have been in the housing market to get into the housing market. Uh, again, the last bullet, subject to AGI limitations, whether or not you can qualify or not. I <clears> know <throat> uh, we're running short, so I'm going to quickly go through these. Uh, the American Opportunity Tax Credit is really nothing more than an expansion of what we refer to as the HOPE Credit. It relates to educational expenses. Um, fairly significant expansion of, um, uh, of amounts for paid for qualified um, educational expenses, tuitions and fees that can give rise to a tax credit. Um, Current year, you go up to $2,500 versus $1,800 uh, $1, uh, for existing law. And that $2,500 would be available for up to four years, one, uh, beginning the year that you first qualify, versus only two years under the HOPE credit as it, current, as it, as it, as it was uh, stated under existing law. Uh, phase out limits again, um, subject to a targeted audience in, in the middle class. If, if we had used those two years under prior law, we now come back in and accept this credit? The question is, can you, can you accept the new credit and, uh, if you've taken advantage of the HOPE credit in the past? I didn't look at that issue. I think the answer is probably yes. Um, if you qualify, um, it would seem to me that it would be counterproductive or counterintuitive to say, no, I can't. Um, uh, so if you would qualify in this year, even though you might have taken it in the prior years, if you qualify in this year, I believe you can get some benefit, if not a full benefit, for, for the new American Opportunity. I would hope that would be the case, but I didn't look at how that interplay worked. Um, uh, and uh, so it's something to take a look at. 